1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. We've been looking in the, on Sunday evenings at some biblical convictions. Uh, the first one we looked at is God alone is sovereign, and the Bible is His inspired word and the final authority for my life. Now, that's a foundational conviction, isn't it, really? Had opportunity to talk to some folks at the wedding and you know, a lot of religions aren't, aren't based on the Bible. And uh, when you talk to them about what we do and why we do it, oh, you're different, you know, than what we do. And, well, what you do is not in the Bible. And then they always say, well, it's just interpretation. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's a very, very basic conviction that uh, the Bible is the inspired word and the final authority for my life. The other one we looked at is my purpose in life is to seek God with my whole heart and to build my goals around His priorities. You know, our purpose and our priorities, very important. Well, tonight we're looking at a third one. My body is the living temple of God and must not be defiled by the lusts of the world. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. It's a very familiar verse. It starts with a question, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The question I would ask this evening is, do you believe those? <laughs> uh, is, is that your conviction? You know, it's, it, it's strange sometimes how we'll mentally say, yeah, I believe that. And then in our life, we don't always act like we believe it. Uh, very important. You know, God has an intention for you. And uh, you're not just a, a soul to Him. You're a complete person, body, soul, and spirit. And God cares about you as a complete person, and you will have a body in eternity. Now, praise God, it'll be, a, be different. <laughs> it, won't, it won't keep falling apart. But uh, you know, God views you as an individual. It's not like some of the religions te teach where you cease existing. I was, I was thinking the other day, you know, I, I don't know if you, you hear about some of these religions where the idea is to just get rid of yourself. I, I remember seeing a cartoon where Charlie Brown kept trying to hit the baseball and then catch it. And he finally did it. He hit it and he caught it. And then he got this puzzled look on his face and he said, I'm out. <laughs> and, you know, that's kind of the way some of these religions are. If they succeed, we're out. <laughs> we're done. But God loves us, and He made us the way we are. He made us with a body and with a soul and with a spirit. And each one of those are, are important. And, and His goal, Philippians chapter 1, verse 20, He says, According to my earnest expectation and, and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Uh, God's intention is, uh, for your body is to glorify God. Yeah. The Bible says in, in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 that someday we're going to give an account of what we've done in our body. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that, to that he hath done. Now, there's going to be reward or, or loss of reward. And... Uh, he has a plan for us. He has a purpose that in our bodies we would glorify Him, that we would use them for His glory. That's what he says in 1 Corinthians 6, 20 there. You're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. But there are some problems. Now, I was thinking about it today. I've never been a woman. So I, I don't know how it goes for women. But I know... And I've not been every man. I've only been one man. But uh, for men, there's a problem having a body. <laughs> you know, it's, it, there's some problems. And uh, we'll look at some of them here. 1 Corinthians chapter, um, chapter 3 and verses 16 and 17. Quite a few of the verses are in Corinthians. Then we go to Romans. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. He says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. You know, our tendency is to defile 
uh, the body that God has given to us. You see this graphically in our day and age with the proliferation of tattoos. Uh, it's, it's like the devil's graffiti. Now, if you have a tattoo, don't, don't worry about it. You can use it for the glory of God. But, uh, uh, you, you know, it's just, it just it's such a graphic illustration. of. Do you know that there's places where people brand themselves? It's not uncommon in parts of America where they'll, they'll literally brand themselves. And I, I don't know that much about it. But in other places, they'll cut themselves and do all these, these things. They'll, they'll deface their bodies. You know, that's not the main thing he's talking about, the outward thing. He's talking about using it uh, in ungodly ways. Uh, it's a problem, and it's a problem that, that we face. God's plan is that we glorify Him, but sometimes we, we corrupt it. We corrupt God's plan. Uh, a terrible illustration of this is Romans 1.24, and uh, I know he's, he's mainly directing this at lost people, uh, but he talks about in Romans 1.24 how God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. The, the corruption of, uh, of lust. Uh, we defile the, the temple of God. And in, in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24, I'll read several verses here. He says, I think I just listed 27. That's the main one. It's where he says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Um, you know, many times, we, uh, the problem with our bodies is we, we let them run us instead of us running them. And uh, when our body rules, what he talks about here is we lose God's approval. You know, we're not to live for the lust of the flesh. Uh, what was that verse we learned? Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the, the, the lust of the flesh. And uh, many Christians have let their bodies take control and they've become castaways. They've lost God's approval for, uh, for their ministry. Uh, it's a problem. Uh, particularly there, verse, verse 27. He says our, our, our goal is to put our body under Christ's subjection. Uh, the next one is 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. Let's get past these, but uh, we're well aware of these. 1 Peter 2, verse 11. He says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. That's a problem, isn't it? There's a war against our soul, and it has to do with our body, with the fleshly lusts that we, uh, we fight with. Uh, you know, when you, before the list in Galatians that gives the fruit of the Spirit... He gives a, a list that lists uh, the, the works of the flesh. And man, it's a terrible thing. I've never heard anybody quote that as a memory verse. <laughs> I, I'm sure there's people that have memorized the book of Galatians, but uh, you know, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry. And it just goes on and on with all these uh, lusts of the flesh. And the Bible says that that wars against our soul. And, and you know, you, you experience it. It's a battle, isn't it? And uh, we want our bodies to be under God's uh, control, God's purpose is that our body glorify Him, but it's a battle. L let me just give you one uh, word of encouragement before we get into our hope. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, uh, there's another verse in 1 John as well, but Philippians 3, verses 20 and 21. This is some encouragement because this is our destiny if you're saved. It says, our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body, according to the working whereby He is able even to subdue all things unto Himself. Now, we struggle with it now, but God has said our destiny as Christians is He's going to give us a body like Jesus. Uh, the other verse is 1 John 3, and I think it's verse 2. 
where he says that someday we're not only going to be with him, we'll be like him. When he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And he says in the next verse, that's the motivation for purity physically and spiritually. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. So there's some encouragement. There's a problem. Now, there's difficulty in living the Christian life. God never told us otherwise. You know, he told us when we got saved, it, it's going to be a battle. But he's on our side, and the victory is assured. Now let's, let's look in Romans. There's some real hope here. God teaches us some, some things. Actually, before we get there, let me give you a couple of examples. A, a negative example would be David when he sinned with Bathsheba. David was a, a godly man, and yet he gave in to the lust of the flesh. And when, when he was confronted by Nathan in uh, 2 Samuel 12, Nathan said to him, Thou art the man. And David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. How be it? Because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. See, the problem when we don't follow this conviction, when we don't live uh, for the Lord physically, it, it gives occasion for the Lord to be blasphemed. It dishonors the Lord. A positive example would be Daniel. Now, Daniel and Joseph in the Bible, I'm, I'm told, there's really no bad thing said about them. That doesn't mean that they never did anything wrong, but uh, Daniel chapter 1 Daniel was a, a godly young man confronted with some very difficult situations. And the Bible says he, uh, it's Daniel 1.8, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Uh, therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Uh, Daniel was a, a godly man and he lived his conviction. And here he was, he was a prisoner. You know, he wasn't boss but he, at risk of life and limb, he said, no, that's, we just can't do that. I can't do that. And, uh, you know, what a, what a stand he took. It's interesting, as you go through the book of Daniel, other people knew his convictions. Uh, the king, uh, when he came to him, said, Daniel, thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And he knew that da Daniel was a man of God. And the people who wanted to trip up Daniel... Uh, they knew that the only way they could trip him up, well, in fact, it says that they could find none occasion nor fault for as much as he was faithful. Then they said, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. <laughs> the only way we're going to trip him up is by him keeping the law of God because he always, he always does that. What a, what a testimony. And here was a man who, who had that conviction. My body is the living temple of God and must not be defiled uh, by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the world. Uh, Daniel lived his conviction. What a good example. Well, let's look in Romans chapter 6. We've got lots of time, so uh, we'll just uh, work our way through these verses. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? And when you got saved, he uses the word there, no. No, you're not. Don't you know that you were baptized into, into Christ's death? Now, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Knowing this, he, he keeps using that, no, knowing. Now, verse 9, Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in, in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So he says, you, you can know this, you can know this, you can know this. Here's what Jesus has done. So you can reckon, now that's, <laughs> that's not like the hillbillies use it, 
It say you can mark it down as true. Um, he's not saying, oh, I think maybe. No, he's saying mark it down as true uh, that you're, you're dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's important to understand the transaction that took place when you got saved. You know, Christ died. Well, the Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, we're in his death, we're in his burial, we're in his resurrection. The old man died. We're, we're made new. Therefore, if any man be uh, in Christ, he's a new, new cre creature. <laughs> Boy. In heaven, we'll never grow old. <laughs> uh, dead to sin, alive unto God is, is the point there. We need to understand what God has done. We're dead to sin, alive to God. Hmm? Galatians 2 says much the same thing. Um, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So in, in Romans 6, we understand uh, what God has done, what Jesus Christ did. Uh, we're in his death, we're in his resurrection. Dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. Verses 12 and 13 then, he says, there's a therefore, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. This is an amazing concept. It's a difficult one to practice in your life. And yet it's, what he's saying here is we need to understand it, or we need to count it as true, we need to live it. And uh, you see, what he's saying there is don't let sin reign. Do let Christ reign. You know, don't let sin reign. Don't yield your body to sin. Uh, you've been set free from that. Uh, we're dead to, dead to sin, alive unto God. Do let Christ reign. He's the Lord. You know, we talk about the Lordship of Christ. Well, he's Lord over our body. He's Lord over our soul. Do yield your body to God. Either yield your members, your body, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Uh, yield yourselves unto God. We sing those verses, verses 12 and 13 sometimes. Great uh, verses. I encourage you to memorize them. And he says in verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you. You're not under the law, but under grace. Then in Romans 8 and verse 13, there's many other verses we could look at, but Romans 8 verse 13, he says, For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. What he's talking about here is make it a habit to put to death the deeds of the body. Just begin to make that a, a habit. Uh, he's saying in verse 12 is where the, the notes I have there, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. See, we've been set free from that. He's not saying this is an if, if you do this, you'll... He's saying that's what's happened when you got saved. You made a transaction. You're no longer... You're not a debtor to the flesh anymore. Uh, we are not debtors to the flesh, is the point he's making. I had a physical illustration of this... I've been pastor here long enough, I've probably shared everything that's ever happened to me in my life, I guess, but uh, I, I worked at a restaurant as a boy, as a young man, I should say, and um, I remember when I, when I went off to university, you know, I quit, quit working there. But when I came back, I, it was probably, I don't remember if it was Christmas holiday or summer holiday, uh, my mother worked there, and, and uh, she said, they, they need somebody to work tonight. Okay, I'll go in. Saturday night. Washing dishes, you know, really important job, washing dishes. And uh, at the end of the night, the boss said, now, I need you to work tomorrow. I said, I'm not working tomorrow. Tomorrow's Sunday. Well, if you're going to work here, you're going to work tomorrow. I said, I don't want to work here. <laughs> and to me, that was a, a perfect illustration about what he's talking about. You know, when sin calls, you can go into work if you want to. And sometimes we do, you know, we just get crosswise with God somehow, but we don't have to. We don't work there anymore. Uh, there was a song. I, I don't know if Doug Odom wrote it. I know he sang it. 
how that they, they went back to the house where they used to live. He was the dad, and uh, his, his little boy, his, the song says, he ran and hid behind the door because they'd had such bad memories there. And, and he said to the boy, son, you've got a new daddy now. You don't have to be afraid. Thanks to Calvary, we don't live here anymore. Thanks to Calvary, I'm not the man I used to be. And that's what he's talking about. We're not debtors to the flesh anymore. Uh, sin is not our boss. Uh, we've been made alive. We, we died to sin. We've been made alive to God. And uh, what a blessing it is to know that we're not under obligation to the flesh. Now, verse 23, he does say we groan. <laughs> Uh, ourselves also which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. It, it's not easy living in the flesh, you know, living in, uh, I shouldn't say in the flesh, but, you know, physically. It, it's difficult. Uh, some of you will remember being teenagers. I mean, that was hard enough. Uh, now, now I'm experiencing being a senior citizen, I guess. I don't know what I am, but... You know, they're, they're just, life keeps changing, doesn't it? You think you've got a handle on it? and Man, we grow. It, it can be hard. But in verse 37, he says we conquer. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And what a blessing it is to know that you know, God has given us a physical life. And that's how we experience things. You know, that's how we read our Bible. That's how we take into our soul and our, our spirit. That's how people know who we are. <laughs> we, have a, we have the physical presence. And God has blessed us in you know, various and sundry ways. Uh, and as we live our, our lives, uh, there's going to be trouble because, the, because of the, the physical nature of things. But he says in uh, verse 37, we're, we're more than conquerors uh, through, him that, through him that loves us. Then in uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, a very well-known portion of Scripture. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, God has a, a purpose for our body. He says we're to be a living sacrifice. We're still alive. You don't die when you get saved. If God took every Christian straight to heaven, who'd, who'd be here to witness? Who'd be here to, to live for the Lord? But we, we give ourselves to Him. And, and even physically, we, we place our body at God's disposal. You know, Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, whether by life or by death. Um, we present our body as a living sacrifice, and that includes our mind. That, that includes every part of us. And in verse 2, he talks about not being conformed uh, to the world. You know, there's a temptation there, isn't it? Isn't there to, uh, to, to want to fit in with those around us? And uh, th there's a, a problem as, as Christians because we want to be like Jesus. If you're going to be like Jesus, you're not, probably not going to be like most people around you. Uh, you know, our, our attitudes, we need to be careful that we don't have the attitudes of the world, that we don't have the thinking and the actions of the world, uh, that we don't, even, even in our eating and our dress and, and our family and our sexuality, I mean, you can go on and on, can't you? But we don't want it to be formed by uh, what the world does. There's a, a verse in Second Peter, I think it's chapter 2, verse 8, where he talks about Lot being vexed. You know, Lot lived in Sodom. And he says, this, that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. It's very hard not to let your soul get vexed by the, the wickedness of the world around us. We've got to be careful that we don't let them form our attitudes and our heart, heart thinking. You know, there's, there's a lot of areas of life that... Uh, that we just observe. They're just around us. You know, we can't, we're in the world, but not of it. And we need to be careful that we keep our, our eyes on the Lord. You know, our outward life needs to conform to the Christ who dwells in us. Uh, I asked Azrael to have that song uh, tonight. We are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us so. It's exactly what we're talking about tonight. Uh, the Christ who dwells within us. In uh, Ephesians chapter 
3, I, I won't read it all, but he goes through quite a few verses uh, talking about how we've, uh, Ephesians 3, 14, for instance, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. He's saying that you know, what we believe needs to come out not only in our inner man, but in our expression to the world. Uh, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend and so on, to know the love of Christ. And the Lord is able to, to do that in our hearts and lives. And he says later on, you're a light in the Lord, walk as children of light. How we live, how we walk uh, should reflect, it should conform to the, to the Christ who dwells within us. Uh, one more, Romans chapter 13, verses 13 and 14. It says, Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. A couple of things, that, main things that he gets across here. Number one, we need to put on Christ. Put on Christ. Verse 12, he says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Verse 14, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to let the Lord... Uh, decide uh, who we are and what we should do. Put on Christ. And the, the second thing is, don't provide for the flesh. And when we put on Christ, to me, that I picture putting something on, you know, like, like clothing. You know, it covers us. And, and it makes, makes us, what you wear makes people see you in different ways. And when we put on Christ, we put on His character. We put on his habits. We put on his disposition. You know, putting on Christ. And we need to be careful that we're not making provision for the flesh. Maybe this relates more uh, back to Romans 12, 1 and 2, not conforming to the world. But, you know, there's things that we can do because the world does it. Uh, I'll mention a couple of specifics. Uh, men wearing earrings. Now, that, I, I don't think there's any, necessarily anything... In the Bible, it says a man can't wear an earring. There's people, in the, men in the Bible, that wore earrings. But the problem now is it doesn't identify you with Christ. It identifies you with the world. Uh, it used to be it identified you as a homosexual or a man. We need to stop and think, you know, where does this lead? Where, who does this identify me with? I mentioned tattoos earlier. Uh, you know, I, I can't imagine as a Christian thinking, well, I'm going to get this tattoo for the glory of God. Now, I've seen people use tattoos for the glory of God. Uh, we, we have a preacher friend. He's got tattoos, lots of them, and it gives him lots of opportunities to witness. Now, he, I don't think he'd do that as a Christian. He did that before he was a Christian. And, uh, you know, you can't, you can't go back. Uh, some people have to have a special car. Now, I, I'm not quite sure even how to say this one, but, you, you know, there's some people who it, it's all about the image. Oh, they can never drive a Cortina. You know, they got to drive a, I don't know. I, I was given a car one time. It had mushrooms growing in it. That was a good car. Guy ran into the back of me one time. I said, oh, don't worry about it. <laughs> you, know, you shouldn't have to worry about things like that. You know, we don't need an image. We need, we need the Lord. We need to let the Lord use us. But anyway, uh, don't provide for the flesh. Uh, don't, don't build your life in such a way that it... Uh, it's molded by what the world thinks is, is important. Uh, Wiest, in his word studies, said this means with a view to a passionate craving, something you really desire. Now, let me say, just because you greatly desire something doesn't make it right. Great desire is not a reason. It's not an excuse. I'll tell you what great desire is. It's a great opportunity to honor the Lord. If you greatly desire something and you can see that it's not of the Lord, that means when you give it up for the Lord, it's, it's important. Listen, I, I could give all the liver in the world up to the Lord. It would mean nothing to me. 
<laughs> I don't care about liver. <laughs> but there's other things that are important to me. And if, and if when I give them up, it's because I love the Lord more than I love whatever it is. And that's what I'm saying. Uh, we have an opportunity uh, to serve the Lord. It's an opportunity to honor God when something is, is important to us. And as Christians, uh, we need to be careful that we have a conviction about the physical things of life. Uh, my body is the living temple of God and uh, must not be defiled by, by the lusts of the world. I hope that you, if you don't have, that you will have a conviction regarding your body, regarding your physical life. It, it is a battle. Uh, we all experience that. But you need to recognize God's ownership of your body. Uh, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God. And you're not your own, for you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Uh, let's go to the Lord in, in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your goodness. Uh, Lord, we struggle with some of these truths just because of our uh, contrary nature and Lord, we're so thankful that we have your Holy Spirit. We have your word. And Lord, we have your promises to know that our destiny is to be like you. God, help us as we struggle through these years here on earth. Uh, Lord, help us to be the, uh, the testimonies that we should. Help us to be like Daniel. Lord, help us to be bold and brave in, in uh, standing for you. Uh, Lord, I know many of our folks are, are struggling with this and, and other convictions. And Lord, help us to, uh, uh, to trust you. Help us to seek your forgiveness when we fail. and uh, Lord, help us to just uh, uh, claim the victory in, in, your Lord, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.